The only real constant is change. No place knows that better than Singapore. In 1965, the people we now know as Singaporeans found themselves separated from Malaysia, the nation they thought they belonged to. It was a heartbreaking time for Singapore as it became a sovereign nation overnight, with nothing but a seaport to work with. The city had no natural resources, no military, and a looming homelessness and an employment problem. Its people needed to have faith that the future held a place for them. In a single generation, Singapore went from a poor, newly formed city-state to a global contender in finance, trade and technology with the third highest GDP per capita in the world. Our planet and our civilizations are changing faster than ever before. Join me as I travel the globe talking to startup founders using technologies to make our world more interesting, accessible and livable. These are the entrepreneurs that are creating the future we will live in. This is Now Go Build. Since those tough early days, Singapore has become a place of shiny towers, beautiful temples, huge public gardens full of art, and a public transportation system that is the envy of Asia. On top of all of that, Singapore is now home to one of the most exciting startup communities in Asia. I wanted to find out what makes Singapore so attractive to startups. I decided to talk to Kyo Lim about it. He is a Singapore native, a computer scientist, and an entrepreneur turned venture capitalist. If anyone knows what's going on with the startup culture of Singapore, it is Kyo Yi. Singapore is quite unique, um, you know, definitely in the region as being such a very different city or, or country. Yeah. From your perspective, what makes Singapore unique? I think you just said it there. A city and a country at the same time. It has its advantages in terms of size and scale and speed and ability to do things fast. And obviously in the last 30 to 40 years, the political system gives you the ability to be a bit more foresighted okay. in how they you know, implement policies and, and all of that. So I think the confluence of that has led to a lot of interesting stuff happening in the last uh, 10, 15 years because it's a city and a country at the same time. Folks who come here and want to start businesses can get that going relatively quickly. Uh, there are a bunch of you know, service providers around you, lawyers, accountants, etc. And the very visible stuff are the grants and, and support for entrepreneurs to set up companies. Um, and that's been a very active intervention in terms of making the system go faster. What is it that you, that you look for in a founder? As a VC, you know, when we invest in a company, we're looking for great founders. Technical team, you can software at some level, mm -hmm. but founders are hard to create. Founders, the often obsessed visionaries that Kyo Yi is looking for. Pranoti Nagakar and Rishi Israni founded one of Singapore's energetic new startups. Simplistic. Two engineers, husband and wife. Pranoti is a mechanical engineer and Rishi a software engineer. The perfect team to work in the realm of the Internet of Things. They have invented the Rotimatic, a data-driven, automated, machine learning roti maker. It is just the first step in the vision of a fully realized, intelligent kitchen. Meeting Pranotti and Rishi seemed like a good excuse as any to visit one of Singapore's famous hawker centers. I came to Singapore when I was 19, and I've been here for 18 years. I came here when I was 16, 17. I don't want to tell you how many years I've been here, then you'll figure out my age. But we came here uh, to do our education because uh, you know there's a lot of scholarships given in Singapore to bring foreign talent in. And then I went on to a university here to do my mechanical engineering. That's where I met Rishi, in fact. We would always sit and discuss what are the big problems in the world, and uh, we would have a lot of arguments on the way of thinking and approaching things. Yeah. But we are still very happily married. <laughs> and, <laughs> So when we came here, we really missed our home food. Because you know, the culture is all about sitting together, eating, and it's all around food. So you're done with your breakfast, the discussion is around, okay, what shall we make for lunch now? So uh, yeah, I think rotis, you know, it's part of every meal, but it's extremely tedious, and it needs a lot of skill to make. So how much work goes into making a roti? Yeah. So 
every meal it can take you 20 to 30 minutes. Why is it so hard to make? Any flatbread actually requires a certain amount of skill. Human intelligence plays a huge role in making rotis, which is the sensing or the intuition that we talked about of knowing when it is right. When the dough, the dough. is right, yes. when the dough is right. Yes. That was very crucial because that makes all the difference to the end result of the rotis. A puffed okay. roti means it's a, it's a perfect roti. So, and to getting every roti to puff is not easy. I'm thinking we are going to challenge you tomorrow in our office to making <laughs> rotis and then you'll know. <laughs> so you guys set out to solve this problem. Who started with the idea? I remember we were chatting one night and I said, Rishi, I'm done with this project. I'm ready to quit and, you know, start Rotimatic. And, and you know, it was, a, it was a time of our lives. We had just gotten married and we had no money because I was doing my startup almost on no salary. Yeah. She was quitting her, deciding to quit her job, and it was a chat that we had in the evening. Next morning, she quit. Uh, yeah, okay. I oh. put in my resignation. <laughs> you need to have um, a certain vision as a as a founder, Absolutely. because otherwise, it's very hard to keep doing what you're doing. Early days were very fun, actually. Uh, when you're, you're reminding me again, I I, I yeah. transport me back. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Cheers. Cheers. So what's happening here? It is making that dough ball right now. Okay. And this is where the AI is in motion. Okay. It's actually detecting if the dough ball is correct in consistency. If it is not, then it'll keep adding a little bit flour or water. Okay. And it'll keep adjusting it till it's a perfect dough ball. So what kind of sensors are in there? to sense whether the, the ball is correct or not. So there are multiple sensors there. If it's a hard dough ball, there's more resistance. So okay. you measure the torque. And all that is fed to the algorithm, which has a particular statistically an analyzed graph, which tells you, is it in the good band or bad band? And accordingly, okay. it'll adjust. Okay. So, so what so, just happened here is that that dough ball was made yeah. and it got moved to the pressing section. And so pressing happens here at a lower temperature because when you're rolling a roti, it's a cold press. Okay. So the same thing happens, it retains the moisture of the roti. Okay. And then it sort of kicks the roti forward, which it's doing now. Okay. Yeah, and so there you're... So there you have a roti. Okay. Ready to eat. <laughs> Great roti. Thank you. So Pranthina always have this joke. She says, you know, Rishi, whatever you do, you cannot eat software. <laughs> so for the, for the kitchen to evolve, of course, it has to get a little bit more robotic. But we think you can build devices that mm -hmm. have a narrow set of capability, but fully autonomous. Yeah. And you can put together some of these devices to, to change the way we cook. I belong to the generation of women who have been the providers in the past, who have to nourish the family. But at the same time, you have to balance a career and you have to balance you being an engineer. I want something fulfilling out of that. So, amazing device. I understand you worked on it for quite a number of years before actually software was introduced. Yes. So, why did you move from, let's say, a hardware-only device to also having a major software component? You know, our first priority was to get the product right. Just before, we were almost ready with the product, and then we realized that we'd need to service it. And when we got into the details of servicing, we realized how big a challenge it would be. And then we started exploring the AWS IoT systems. And the more and more we implemented and explored it, the more benefits we reaped, not just in the first attempt of getting the service right, but also in collecting further data to improve our models. But it mm -hmm. turned out to be the, now it's the core central uh, backbone of our operations. It's also a product requirement as we as the users, you don't want us to be locked into using a particular type of flour. So that means if you're making a tortilla, you're using a cornmeal flour. If you're making a roti, you're using a whole wheat flour. Okay. And you want it to actually extend into making any kind of flatbread. Okay. So to extend it into a platform, I think the software was very, very crucial. So here's our IoT dashboard, where we collect all the data from all the various machines to help improve the product, to help improve uh, customer experience and after-sales service. This one is showing different countries and what sort of number of rotis that have been made, how many machines are online, how many users are happy with rotimatic performance. We also track all the errors that happen on the machine. This informs us and helps us prioritize what to fix first and where to put our engineering resources. So you can see every roti making, every dough ball that we make, we collect tons of sensor data, which tells us how much water was used, what's the hardness, what are the errors that were faced, what was the size of the dough ball, and of course, which firmware version and all. So all of this helps us improve the machine over time. How do you go from that data to improving your model 
to to sort of become better. So mm-hmm. we've built a closed loop mechanism where you rate your roti experience at the end of every cycle. And as we improve our product, uh, release after release, you can see how, how different software versions uh, improve customer experience. So we have data-driven, data-backed understanding of what's actually going on with all the efforts that we're putting in. I remember we would have these uh, conversations on how to design a connected system. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning when IoT wasn't the buzzword yet, we were discussing can we put a SIM card inside Rotimatic? Then can it talk to us? Somehow tell us that it's alive. And then when IoT came and the Wi-Fi module, it just changed the whole way it now is if you have any issue with your machine you just log into our app there's a chat window you chat with our agents they have a dashboard which appears on their screens which tell you the health stat of your machine so they already know what's wrong with the machine and they send you a software patch if there's a hardware issue we send our logistics partners like fedex or ups and they just give you a replacement I remember there was one particular uh, phase when, you know, we tried to make it an embedded system where, you know, you have a fixed program that can run it and hopefully figure out the right proportion of flour and water. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't enough. You had to build machine learning in because every time you make a dough ball, you learn something more about it and you use it for the next dough ball. And it just kept making the machine better and better. We've seen machine learning mostly in computer systems where things are not moving as much. Here with life, there's degradation in all the tolerances and all the different parts. So the performance of parts keeps shifting over time. Oh. So there's this aging. Is... There's aging of the mechanical components yeah. of the parts. Which doesn't happen, so... it's only pure software systems. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. so that was also taken into account across the life of the machine we were collecting data. How much of, of this did you really know as a software engineer? Or... Oh, it was a new world for me. Actually, I was completely taken aback by the complexity in hardware, and especially such complex robotic hardware is order of magnitude harder. And every single time it needs to give you that output. With so many moving parts, with the manufacturing complexity, how do you ensure at a certain price point with commodity motors and commodity sensors Mm -hmm. and linear systems, you give the same precision every time? So this is whole wheat flour. It's got all the fiber, all the nutrition in it. And you have to mix it with the right amount of water. It's easier for you. Next. Next step. You have to take a, like one spoon of oil, make a small well, and then you start mixing while you put the water. Okay. But don't put too much because suddenly it will be too much. Okay, I, I know, so I'm just going to go put for it. Put very little, yeah. Okay. So guys, imagine this is for lunch and dinner and sometimes even breakfast. And you know, sometimes there's, there are times when, you know... <laughs> <laughs> I think it's been a long time since I did it. I am realizing. Turn. So you see, <laughs> so if you see, if you had a little bit more water, yeah. it would have perhaps been easier. But see, now the time has passed. Now you can't add water to it <laughs> because the gluten ones are. Now you start rolling this. Okay. Into a was... round shape and evenly thin. Just enough pressure. But you see, it's thick here yeah. and thin there, and then it won't puff. What, what do you say? What do you say? Yeah, not bad. Oh, <laughs> nice. Oh, look at mine. Yes, yeah. yes, it is. Press a little bit here so the air sort of gets pushed on. Okay. But very gently. No, it's too late. Too late, yeah. There's a puffing momentum. You lose it, yeah. <laughs> it's gone. Well, you need to show how hard it is to actually do it then. Yeah. So. And this roti is perhaps you will not serve it for your family, but you'll keep it for yourself. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> From a software guy's perspective, uh, somebody who who only enjoyed to eat food but never got into the realm of figuring out how to make food, I've realized a few big problems with our world. 70% of illnesses are lifestyle disease related and they are primarily related to the type of food you consume. One third of the world's food is wasted. So on the one hand you have people who are unhealthy and maybe eating a little bit more than they need and on the other hand you have people who are dying because of Mm -hmm. lack of food and we find that these two problems are actually prime problems to be solved by the kitchen of the future. Again, a software guy with a software hat, I think the big challenge is that the data that is required to solve these problems is in silos and if we could just connect some systems and if the data could just come out, we'd be able to solve those problems. If you look at what's happening in the world today, our generation, we are forgetting how to cook. We are forgetting 
the basics of nutrition. As young parents, we, we worry about uh, the right nutritional uh, framework to teach our kid. Like, how should you look at food? What's good? What's not good? So this is again a data problem. It's again an information data problem. I mean, we already know how to fix the knowledge gaps, but you can also fix the execution gaps by building machines that are fully connected and that exchange information with each other mm -hmm. to deliver a cooking experience. And also sees all of those devices as a platform, Absolutely. not only as a uh, as a single function device. Correct. Yeah, like that's that's the error of the you know it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's software error. eats the world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't eat software. <laughs> you can't eat software. <laughs> the long look. The visionaries. The ones who can see a future that the rest of us may not see. As we race into the future, enabled by the cloud, assisted by machine learning, driven by faster and more powerful computers, it will take intention to hold on to age-old traditions. And yet, it is that very technology that gives us the tools to build better, more efficient ways of holding on to things that we never want to live without things that we want to take with us into this promising future. It makes all the sense in the world that optimistic visionaries like Pranotti and Rishi have made their home here in Singapore, a place where the past is never forgotten and that long optimistic look towards the future has not faltered.